Well, good evening, all, or good day, good afternoon, wherever you happen to be. I have just had you, all of you, on my mind and heart today, as always. And I was thinking that it has been a while since I have done a bedtime story. So I wanted to share with you this evening the story of Dr. Lillian B. Yeomans and how she was delivered from a morphine addiction. Now, when we're sick, we can have medications prescribed that cause an addiction and have an effect, an adverse effect on our bodies. So that is how I would apply Dr. Yeoman's story to our healing group because of the physical ravages that her body went through because of the morphine addiction. There was, she tried different cures and nothing helped. And the reason again that I wanted to share her story was because she got it by doing what we're talking about here, getting into the word of God. And as she took the medicine of God's word, she was healed of her morphine addiction and all of the ravages that it had caused in her body. So this is from a little book that I have. It's called Healing Treasury, and there are four different ones of Dr. Yeoman's books in here. She was a medical doctor, as you will see from her testimony. And she, after being healed, went into the healing ministry. So she has a wonderful story. If you don't know anything about her, I would encourage you to look her up on Google and study or read some more of her history. Oh, Father, I send this little messenger out in this bedtime story. Lord Jesus, how mighty and powerful your living word is to us when we mix it with faith, when we take time to give our attention to it. Father, I don't know the conditions of each person that will listen to Dr. Yeoman's testimony, but Father, the ravages in her body could be comparable to situations that they may be dealing with. So Father, help them to listen, to be encouraged about their own situation, not just hear this as a historical story. And, and say, good night, and thank you for that wonderful story. No, Father, you told me when I began these stories that the reason for them was so that they could go to sleep thinking about the power of God. And so, Father, with that, that purpose in mind, I share this story. And I thank you, Father, for encouraging their hearts and stirring their faith in Jesus' name. How I Was Delivered from Drug Addiction by Lillian B. Yeomans. She begins with Psalm 130. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, would mark iniquities, O oh, Lord, who should stand? O, oh, but there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared, reverenced. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say, more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. And with him there is plenteous, plenteous 
redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Oh, she goes on. Out of the depths he lifted me. Abyss calls to abyss. Deep answers to deep. Only those who know what it is to be bound as I was. Captive of the mighty, the prey of the terrible. Oh, only those will be able to understand how great was the deliverance which God wrought in me when he set me completely free from the degrading bondage of morphine and chloral habits to which I had been a slave for years. Just draw the parallel, Hill, or with any condition that you may be dealing with that you feel like you have been a slave to for years. Sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death, I'm believing that there are people that hear this story that mix faith with the, with the word of God that she's sharing, that even if they're on the brink of death, they're going to come back. Come back from the brink of death. That's where she was. Sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in aff affliction and iron. Oh, I cried unto the Lord in my trouble, and he saved me out of my distress. He brought me out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke my bands asunder. Oh, do you not think that I have reason to praise God and glorify with every breath our all-conquering Jesus? <laughs> my sad story has a glad ending. But if anyone asks me, how I contracted the morphine habit and became a drug addict, I can only say, through my fault, my fault, my most grievous fault. I had been saved several years before, but like Peter, at one stage of his career, I was following afar off, and I fell into this snare. It is a dangerous thing to follow afar off. I proved that to my cost. Of course, it is needless to say that nothing was further from my thought than becoming a drug addict. But I was engaged in very strenuous work, practicing medi medicine and surgery. And in times of excessive strain from anxiety or overwork, I occasionally resorted to morphine, singly or in combination with other drugs, to steady my nerves and enable me to sleep. Knowing as I did the awful power of the habit-inducing drug to enslave and destroy its victims and with practical demonstrations of it before my eyes every day, so she saw people every day that were addicted. Seeing before my eyes every day amongst the most brilliant members of the medical profession, I was utterly inexcusable for daring to trifle for even a moment with such a destructive agent. Hmm. And at last, I thought I was toying with the drug. But one day, I made the startling discovery that that drug, or rather the demon power in back of the drug, was playing with me. The bloodthirsty tiger that had devour, devoured so many victims had me in its grasp. Of the anguish of my soul the day I had to acknowledge to myself that morphine was the master and I was the slave, I can even now hardly bear to speak. I have this fault to find with many testimonies to healing, 
that the individual in telling of his healing fails to make it clear that he, the witness, really suffered from the disease of which he professes to have been cured. I find this fault. I'll read that a little slower now. I'll find I have to, I have this fault to find with many testimonies to healing that the individual in telling of his healing fails to make it clear that he, the witness, really suffered from the disease of which he professes to have been cured. It may be quite evident that he believes that he has so suffered, but that is worlds away from the point of the issue, the point at issue. Testimonies of this character are quite valueless from a scientific standpoint, and to avoid falling into this error, I desire to leave no shadow of a doubt on the mind of anyone that I was a veritable victim of morphinomania. Morphinomania, that's quite a word, isn't it? So then she goes on now, and she's going to begin to tell us the details. So I believe what she's talking here, when we give testimony that we've been healed from something, we just say, the Lord heal me of this or that, but we don't always share the details. And the details can be the convincing factor. And it's in the details that other people will relate their condition then to yours and find encouragement from your testimony. <clears throat> she goes on. My ordinary dose of, of morphine varied from 10 to 14 grains a day. I was taking regularly about 50 times the normal dose for an adult man. <laughs> I took regularly about 50 times the normal dose for an adult man. I also took chloral hydrate, a most deadly drug used by criminals in a concoction of the so-called knockout drops. Taking, I took 120 grains in two doses of 60 grains at an interval of one hour each night at bedtime to sleep. The safe dose of chloral, quote, or in parenthesis, indeed there really is no safe dose in my opinion, but the safe dose then that a doctor would prescribe is only about five grains. So I regularly took about 24 times what would be prescribed by a doctor. So she took 50 times the normal dose of morphine, that 50 times the normal dose, dose for an adult man, and 24 times the normal dose that a doctor would prescribe to sleep at night. I took the morphine by mouth in the form of the sulfate in one half grain tablets, which I imported wholesale. Hmm. I was living in Canada at this time and I imported it for my personal use. While some have taken larger doses than this, I find it hard to believe that anyone was ever more completely enthralled in the drug than I was. I could by a desperate effort <laughs> Only God knows how desperate they were. I could by a desperate effort diminish the dose somewhat. But I always reached a minimum beyond which it was impossible to carry the reduction. To ask me whether I had taken the drug on any particular day was as needless as to inquire whether I had inhaled air. Huh. One seemed to be as necessary to my existence as the other. When, by tremendous exercise of my willpower, I abstained from it for 24 hours, my condition was truly pitiable. I trembled with weakness. My whole body was bathed in cold sweat. 
My heart palpitated and fluttered. My respiration was irregular. My stomach was unable to retain even so much as a drop of water. My intestines were racked with pain and tortured with persistent diarrhea. I was unable to stand direct, to articulate clearly, or even sign my own name. My thoughts were unconnected. My mind was filled with horrid imaginings and awful forebodings. And worst of all, my whole being was possessed with the specific, irresistible, indescribable craving for the drug. Anyone who has not felt it cannot imagine what it is. Every cell of your body seems to be shrieking for it. It established a regularity for itself in my case, and I found that at five o'clock each afternoon I had to have it. The demand for it was imperative and could not be denied. I believe I would have known the time by the call of the drug, her body calling for the drug. I believe I would have known the time by the call even if I had been in mid-ocean without watch or clock. Oh, say what you will about willpower. For my part, I am satisfied that no human determination can withstand the morphine demon when once his rule is established. His diabolical power is superhuman. <laughs> but thank God, one, capital O, has said, Luke ten nineteen. I have given you power over all the power of the enemy. Divine power is to be had for the asking and the receiving. Mm. I did not succumb, however, without many fierce struggles. So when she was trying to resist it, I believe I have made at least 57 desperate attempts to rid myself of the horrible incubus, sucking life out of her. Over and over again, I threw away large quantities of the drugs, determined that I would never touch them again, even if I died as a result of abstaining from them. I hope you're sensing the power that this darkness had over her. So whatever has a hold of you, the strength, how, however strong that you feel it is, that's got a grip on you, oh, it can be broken. It will break. Jesus breaks the yoke. Oh, you'll be encouraged as we continue on. <clears throat> I must have wasted a small fortune this way, getting them and then throwing them away to try to abstain from them. I must have wasted a small fortune this way. I tried all the substitutes recommended by the medical profession. I consulted many physicians, some of them men of national reputation. I can never forget the tender consideration that I received at the hands of some of these, but they were, they were powerless to break my fetters. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I got so far away from God that I actually tried Christian science, falsely so-called. I also took the then famous Keeley Gold Cure. I looked that up in Google, by the way. It is there. If there is anything I did not try, I have yet to learn what it is. I left the Gold Cure Institute in a crazed condition and was transferred to a sanatorium for nervous diseases and placed under the care of a famous specialist. From this institution, I emerged still taking morphine and chloral, as the doctors would not allow me to dispense with them, partly because of my physical condition and more perhaps because of my unbalanced mental state which always became aggravated when I no longer used them. Oh, of the suffering these efforts to free myself cost me, I would rather not speak. I was a perfect wreck mentally and physically. Oh, 
Listen to this statement here. I was a perfect wreck mentally and physically. One of my nurses said, I was like a skeleton with a devil inside. Whew. And I think her description, if not very flattering, was accurate enough. My friends had lost all hope of ever seeing me delivered. How about us change that to the word healed? My friends had lost all hope of ever seeing me healed. <laughs> and far from urging me to give up the drugs, they advised me to take them as the only means of preserving what little reason was left to me. They expected my, they expected my wretched life to come to an early close and really could not desire to see so miserable an existence prolonged. Perhaps, perhaps many of us know, quote, The Raven, that weird poem by Edgar Allan Poe. The author, though he has been called the prince of American poets, perished miserably at a very early age as the result of addictions such as mine. In this poem, he represents himself as opening his door to a black raven, a foul bird of prey. Oh, once admitted, the raven resists all efforts to re eject him, but perches himself on a marble bust over the entrance and gazes at the poet with the eyes of a demon. <laughs> Each time he is commanded to depart, he croaks out the ominous word, nevermore, nevermore. <laughs> oh, and she got a little bit of the poem. Take thy beak from out my heart. A beak stabbing him in his heart, Poe said. Take thy beak from out my heart and thy form from off my door. But quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven never flitting, sitting is sitting, city still is sitting, still is sitting. On the pallid, pallid bust of phallus, just above my chamber door, and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Edgar Allan Poe, nevermore. It went from nevermore, the raven said he was leaving, nevermore, the poet said, I'll never get rid of him. The poem is a parable in which the writer tells of his cruel and hopeless bondage to evil habits. It used to haunt me when I too was bound, and again and again Satan whispered to my tortured brain the awful word, nevermore. Nevermore are you going to be healed. Nevermore are you going to be normal. Oh, have you heard him? <laughs> At destruction and famine, Job said, I will laugh. Ha, ha, ha. She goes on. Though I dream night and day of freedom, the dream seemed impossible of realization. I said, it will take something stronger, stronger than death to deliver me. For the hold of the hideous thing is far deeper than my physical being. <laughs> Oh, cancer, death, dealing, diseases. In the name of Jesus, we know the stronger one that delivers from death. She says it will take something stronger than death to deliver me. And I was right, for it took, listen, listen, listen. <laughs> Sweet on the tongue as I say it, and sweet in your ear when you hear it. Romans 8, 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from that law that determines sin and death for me. <laughs> that's, what, 
Well, she didn't say all that, but she did say Romans 8, too. I'm going to read that paragraph again since I kind of got a little carried away there. Hmm? Though I dreamed night and day of freedom, the dream seemed impossible of realization. I said, it will take something stronger than death to deliver me. For the hold of the hideous thing is far deeper than my physical being. Yes. And I was right. It did take something stronger. It took the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which makes us free from the law of sin and death. You ask, did you not pray? Oh, yes, I came to the place where I did nothing else. I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Night after night, I walked up and down our long drawing rooms calling on God and sometimes almost literally tearing the hair out of my head. And you say, well, weren't you healed after that? No, I wasn't healed, because I didn't believe the simple statement of the word of God. Rather, my healing could not be manifested because of my unbelief. So even though she prayed and prayed and prayed, she wasn't praying with faith. She was pleading, begging, hoping. I shut the door and prevented the power of God from operate. I shut the door and prevented the power of God from operating unhindered in my body. Oh, I was thinking about us today, you and me and all of us. And as I was thinking about us, I heard a teeny tiny whisper inside myself. I hear it even now, and it's so quiet, and it's so, oh, it wants to be almost unutterable. It's so wonderful. Oh, it's like I heard something like the Lord saying, take the limits off and just let me do the miracles. <laughs> Oh, Father, just, just throw open the door. Just, 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 just let me do miracles. Oh, like some of the little postings I put up lately. Don't ask questions. Don't, don't doubt. Don't ask why. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Watch your words. Watch, just throw the door open and think, Oh, I'm in the miracle flow of God's healing power. I am in it. I am in the miracle flow of God's healing power. Oh, the beginning of the year, the Lord said, I want you to start using the word wellness, not just the word health. And now, yes, I'm not speaking of the working of miracles, though God can do those at his pleasure. I'm just talking about us Normally, what people call a miracle in the natural, their definition is something happening that seemed impossible. <laughs> something happening that seemed impossible. And it's like the Lord just wants you to just stop all the questioning, all the struggling, all the reasoning, and just throw open the door and say, God, here I am, ready for your miracle. <laughs> uh, anyway, just think about it. Miracles, the miracle, the miracle flow, the miracle flow, the miracle flow. Some of you that have been wanting instant manifestations are going to begin getting them. Just throw open the doors of your inward being, your heart open to heaven and say, God, I'm, I'm ready for your miracle flow. And then don't doubt. Don't doubt if it doesn't happen instantly. Just stay in it. Just stay in the flow. Oh, you'll see here. You'll see as we go on. That's what she did, basically. Oh, I wasn't healed because I didn't believe the word of God. I shut the door and prevented the power of God from operating in my, in my body. Oh, and someone says, and why did you not have faith? Simply because I did not have light enough to take it. <laughs> Oh, Satama, Shikama, 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 Shikatama. 
and see right now I can hear the Lord telling me to tell you. Some of you have received healings because you had light enough to take it, but now you're facing something bigger. And what it's going to take is you getting more light in how God deals with the greater situation. It wants The mountain wants to seem bigger on the inside of you. So you just want more light. You want to get that mountain to God. You want to see how he's going to peel it down. You want to see how the work is going to diminish it. The word, I mean, is going to diminish it. It's like you got such a confidence that came to you regarding the little mountain and you saw it move. Now you might be facing a bigger mountain and the Lord wants you to, what does she say here? The Lord wants you to get more light, more light from him about healing, more light regarding the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, more light regarding Isaiah 53 by Jesus stripes you were healed. We never reach a plateau. We never reach a plateau. That's why I have loved serving Jesus like I have all these years. Colossians says, in him are hidden all the treasures, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and that he is the, in him dwells the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in a bodily form. I see living for Jesus. I see getting to know him. I climbed one mountain and oh, I saw one facet of him. And then there's another mountain and oh, I'm going to go for that one next. And then I get that one. And then, oh, there's another one. And I'm, oh, Jesus, there's another something to know about you. Oh, Jesus, there's another project to overcome with your help. And I go on and I go on from one mountain to the next not one valley to the next, one mountain to the next. You get to the top of the mountain and you can see clearly, you can see that light shining on your present position. And oh, the Lord says right now, and it'll be neutered. It will be neutered. Who? I can't add any more to that. Lord, have mercy, have mercy. <sighs> And why did you not have enough faith? Simply because I did not have enough light to take it. God's method of bestowing it is through his word. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I was getting very weak. Now she's speaking physically. I was getting very weak and spent hour after hour in bed. And God, are, are any of you bed fast out there? I was getting very weak and spent hour after hour in bed and God in his mercy kept me so much alone so that he could talk to me. At last, I drew my neglected Bible to me and plunged into it with full purpose of heart to get all there was for me, to do all that God told me to do to believe all he said. Oh, yes. And praise God, the unsolvable problem was solved. My, my, my. See, that's what we're, if you don't have anybody to pray with you, if you've exhausted all the doctor's remedies, here's the solution. That's what I'm holding out here on this page. The word of God. He sent his word to heal us. Your faith in his word. At last, after she did everything else, went for cures, went to the doctors, prayed, walked the floor by the hour. She says, then at last, I drew my neglected Bible to me and plunged into it with full purpose of heart to get all there was for me, to do all that God told me to do to believe all he said, and then praise God, the unsolvable problem was solved. The impossible was achieved. The deliverance was wrought. There is no trouble about it when we, God, can get us to meet his conditions of repentance and faith. And when God says faith, he means faith. It is well to know that. That's why I've been encouraging all of you. Watch your thoughts. Watch your words. Don't ask why. Don't give place it out. Get faith and stay in it. Some of you are so precious. You listen to tapes. You build your faith. You do your confessions. But then all of a sudden, this out here, you get earthbound again. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so you want to just get faith and stay in it. Thank you, Father. 
When God says faith, he means faith. It is well to know that. If anyone asks by what special scripture verse I was healed, I feel as though I could almost say I was healed by the whole book. For it is there in Job, the oldest book in the Bible, that has as clear a teaching on healing and the atonement as the word contains. Can you imagine that? The book of Job, she says. Most of the time we don't hear anything good out of the book of Job. That's because it isn't taught right. It's not interpreted right yet. For it is there in the book of Job, the oldest book of the Bible, that has a as clear a teaching on healing in the atonement as the word contains. And then she gives a scripture verse, Job 33, 24. In Genesis, God made man as he wanted him in his own image and likeness, even as to his physical being, being free from disability. Oh, you'll find healing in Exodus when the people of God marched out of Egypt. For in Psalms 105, 37, we read that they marched out and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Think of it. What a glorious procession. How did they do it? Through the wonder-working power of the blood of the Passover lamb. Oh, there is power, power, wonder-working power. The precious blood of the lamb. Remember the old song? Power in the blood. Oh, read about it in Leviticus in the leper cleansing ceremony, where the leper, when he had not a sound spot on his entire body, was healed by the blood of the bird slain over running water in an earthen vessel, which is a picture of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot unto God. In Numbers, every recorded case of sickness is dealt with by supernatural means. Prayer, sacrifice, and atonement. In Deuteronomy, God explicitly promises to take away all sickness from his obedient people. Oh, suffice it to say, I found a great number of healing passages in the Bible. And when God's words were found, oh, I ate them. And they did their work. <laughs> when God's words were found, I ate them and they did their work. They never fail. I knew I was healed, that I couldn't help being healed because God is faithful. And I almost lost interest in my symptoms. Oh, my heaven. See, this is kind of what I've been kind of working with you to get your mind out of focusing here and get your mind focused on what's going on up around Christ. See, in the process of allowing that to happen, what did she say? She lost interest in her symptoms. Isn't that a wonderful phrase? Can you see the vision of that? The symptoms were still there, but she lost interest in them. Oh, Jesus, help us. <clears throat> I almost lost interest in my symptoms. I was so certain of the truth. The drugs went. I didn't know for 19 years after my healing what became of them. I thought maybe God would send an angel to take them away. And I was watching for him. <laughs> but the first thing I knew, they were gone. And that alone wouldn't have helped much, but something else was gone. The specific, irresistible, indescribable craving produced by the demon power was gone. The hideous black bird of prey that croaked nevermore had flown, never to return. I had no more use for morphine and chloral than for rat poison. I had no room for them or any other drugs in my physical economy. My appetite became so excellent that I had to eat about seven meals a day, and I had no room for drugs. And needless to say, my soul was filled with his praises. Luke 4, Luke 1, 46 and 47. My soul does magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. And the best of all is that this healing was no happy accident. Oh, 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 listen, listen, listen. This healing was no happy accident, no special miracle on my behalf, but the working 
out in me of God's will for all of us. And that is perfect soundness by faith in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So far as I know the field, God's work is being done today principally by men and women who have been raised from physical as well as spiritual death. People who were given up to die by the medical profession. I believe I could give offhand the names of 100 of them. And there are still vacancies in the ranks of the army of the king. If you are afflicted, step out and receive healing and then get to work. <laughs> she says, I was in Chicago immediately after my healing and went one day to the women's temple, to the noon prayer meeting. I don't know how it is now, but it used to be a rallying place for Christian workers. They came from the Moody Bible Institute and many missions and churches. When I walked in, I found the preacher talking of the awful snares in which people who trifle with narcotic drugs, including tobacco, get entangled. He warned them to give them up entirely if they were tampering with them. And then he sat down. I knew from experience that they couldn't give them up. I knew from experience that they couldn't give them up unless they took Jesus. And so, prompted by the Holy Spirit, I rose and asked if I might say a word. Oh, it was not parliamentary for me to do this, but God was in it, and I got leave. Then I said, I am glad for the good advice our brother has given us. And I want to tell you how to do it. And I am speaking from the depths of experience. And I told my story. I think many of them didn't believe in divine healing before I told it. But I don't believe there was one who didn't believe in it after I had finished. I was so happy, like some caged thing set free, that they couldn't help rejoicing with me. And spontaneously, they rose to their feet and in one great burst of praise sang, All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. <laughs> O oh, ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Oh, my, my, my. I don't know if you've heard that song lately. It's a wonderful hymn. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him. Lord of all. Oh, that's what I just want to see you get get swept up. Oh, shikala masandala basatala masa. Swept up. Hallelujah in the presence. Oh, and you'll come back. Weller. Weller than you went. <laughs> oh my. Thank you, Father. She being dead is yet ministering to us and her rewards are yet accumulating in heaven. Thank you, Father. I know this was about a woman that had a, had a medical addiction, medicine addiction, but so many things, the way it ravaged her body, so many of those conditions can be a parallel to what you are dealing with. Some of you in various stages, in various places in your body. Oh, throw open the door to the wind of blows carrying the miracles of God. <laughs> oh, get swept up in the presence, in the atmosphere of miracles. Oh, Sakalamandaria Sondalabasa. <laughs> oh, I worship you, Father. I worship you. Outward bound from where we stand. 
Going into God, I am. The very heart of God's my home. And though no one else comes, I'll go alone. Oh, hallelujah. Shoda basanda. Shikalama sanda. Sometimes we get so caught up in wanting to know. And I know I advise a lot of you. Let the Lord lead you step by step. Seek his wisdom. He will walk you through to wellness. Well, I think he's just giving us another tool in the arsenal. Not that you shouldn't still keep listening. But when he speaks a mighty word, like get in the wind where the miracles are blowing, just just don't question, don't doubt, just listen to whatever I tell you and do it. That's what Jesus did when he healed people. Take up your bed and walk. Stretch forth your hand. Oh, take, oh, just think of it. Nearly every person that Jesus healed, he told them to do something. If you hear that little voice of God telling you, stretch out your arm, get out of your bed. Open your eyes wider, wider, wider. See clearly, see clearly. The Holy Spirit can speak to you and bring you into that life of wellness. As she said, how did she say that? Here at the end, she said the same thing that we've been talking about. God wants us to have perfect soundness. That's what it was. She said, the best of all this is that healing is no happy accident, no special miracle on my behalf, she said, but it is the working out in me of God's will for, it was the working out in her of God's will for all of you, which is perfect soundness. By faith in the name, by faith in the stripes, by faith in the word, by faith in the shed blood. Oh, Soraba, I walk by faith, I talk by faith, I think my thoughts by faith. Hebrews 6, one of the foundational principles, faith toward God, toward God, toward God. Hallelujah. If you say the word hope, it's kind of like it just hangs right here. But when you say faith, something on the inside of you gushes like that and goes out toward God. Oh, just enjoy that. Just do that. Oh, turn the faucet on and don't ever turn it off. Well, I don't know how anybody's going to go to sleep listening to this. <laughs> huh. Ooh, I'm outward bound. From where I stand, I'm going into God, I am. I'm going in, I am. The very heart of God's my home. If no one comes, I'll go alone. I'm going in, I am. Yes, I'm going in to where few men have been. I'm going into the heart life of the maker of men, into the innermost place of his being. I'm going in. I am. Oh, come and go with me to my father's house. <sighs> Father, I thank you tonight. Oh, the winds are blowing again, just like on the day of Pentecost. Oh, Father, when David was facing the army and you told him, you said, oh, just hunker down there in that ditch. And when you hear the sound of the rushing in the mulberry trees, you know the move, the move, the move is on. Move on, brother. Move on, sister. This is your wellness day. <laughs> oh, Father, the wind is blowing again, and I can hear it. Oh, Father, I thank you. There's miracles blowing on that wind. I throw open my life to them, Lord. Oh, I thank you. I just let you do in me what you said. I let you do your will in me, Father, to bring wellness and soundness, healing and health, Father, to be a testimony to your glory that I might continue, Father, in the work you've called me to do. And Lord, for these, as we first talked about when we started the Life of Wellness classes, 
You desire to heal with a purpose because you have a destiny for each one and you want them to be well so they can do it. And so, Father, I know that is your desire above all things that we prosper and be in health. And Father, I thank you that you, by these testimonies, your encouragement, your word, your teaching, you're giving us understanding. Father, you're causing us to prosper, our souls to prosper in the knowledge of you. Oh, Father, we praise you. What a mighty God we serve. What a wonderful Father. Oh, Lord, to get to heaven and see you, Father, (laughs) and just plant kisses all over your face. (laughs) Oh, God bless you all. I pray you've enjoyed this wonderful little testimony and our short time together. Ah, Thursday night. I am really looking forward to our Thursday night study uh, in our Life of Wellness class. I believe the title this time is You Must Find Yourself in the Word. God bless you all. Good night.